Hello, good morning, and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. It's super and really actually very lovely to see all of you here this morning. It's always great to have a packed house and a special hello to Wayne, who's been missing for a while. So welcome back, Wayne. My name is Farah, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. A very warm welcome to you all. And so to our speaker this morning, growing up, Rob enjoyed knowing how things worked especially things that did stuff and moved. However, his grandfather thought Rob was rather a difficult child. <laughs> this was especially reaffirmed when Rob found his grandfather's toolbox in the garden shed one day. He was always taking things apart to see how they were built. Things rather came to a head one evening when Rob embarked on dismantling his grandfather's much beloved carriage clock and this duly broke. Rob was later to find out that this had actually belonged to his great-grandmother. After that particular incident, Rob was grounded and all sleepovers were banned and wherever he went, he had to be accompanied. <laughs> That's really bad. <laughs> Finally, Airfix and Meccano became readily available and that was the start of Rob's making things. Inspired by his father, an engineer and practical man who used to make his children's toys rather than buy them, Rob was inspired to carry on making and designing. He duly set off to Brunel University to study industrial design, where the course was centered around the understanding, the practicality of designing the concept and not just the calculations and rendered images. Workshops for metal, metalwork, plastics, woodwork were like an Aladdin's cave for Rob. As the students had to pay for the materials required to design their coursework, Rob would look for clients who would provide him a commission. This resulted in an insulin cooler for friends with diabetes, a pill reminder for an uncle who had just suffered a heart attack, and finally, Rob was sponsored by Colt International, a local engineering company that paid for the rest of his studies as he completed his degree. Rob has now been in industry for 23 years, which has flown by, initially moving around departments from R&D, production engineering, sales and marketing. Rob was particularly inspired by his time working for a Swiss company where he specialised in designing movable systems for low energy buildings. Rob has been with Arup for just four years and during this time he has worked on an incredible 168 metre high statue in India, the iconic gas holders at King's Cross, Lucille Stadium for the Qatar World Cup and new offices for Google at King's Cross. And so, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce the very charming and the very tall Rob Buck. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah, for that uh, charming and rather long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honour to be asked uh, to speak at this event, and uh, thank you for the hard work that you, Farah, and your team put into organising and delivering these uh, thought leadership series. I was eventually forgiven for taking apart the carriage clock, but I guess those early years and the feeling of amazement of how those mechanisms worked sat me on this path, and uh, such I'm here to speak to you with you today. It's been a beautiful, clear morning, but as we enter the autumn months, we will put on our warm clothes and we wear our sunglasses a little less. But unlike us, our buildings will look the same. And that is what I would like to talk to you about today. Imagine if the facade of our buildings adapted to the external weather conditions, just as we do. So let's start and ask the question, what is an adaptable facade? This is my quote. Uh, an adaptable facade is one that moves either automatically or by manual means to allow the occupants to benefit from the changing weather conditions. Is this? A shutter system on a residential house in France, an adaptable facade. I would argue that it is. Through a combination of tilting the louvers and opening the window behind, the system can allow natural airflow whilst preventing the heat of the sun entering the building. The shutters can provide secure nighttime ventilation 
and on overcast days, they can be folded back to maximise the daylight entering the room. And this, the Kaifa Technik showroom in Austria, the vertical sliding folding shutters can change the daylight into the space, as well as completely changing the appearance of the building. Now imagine a street where the facade of the building has changed depending on what was going on either inside the building or the external environment. It would certainly create an, an exciting streetscape. And these images show the towers of the Abu Dhabi Investment Council the motorised parasols open and close in response to the sun's path across the sky. External shading significantly reduces the solar heat gain entering the building, allowing much clearer glass that would otherwise be permitted. Yet adaptable facades do not need to be these high-end exemplar buildings. On a more typical scale, the solution could be a simple awning or simple external blinds, whether they be Venetian or roller systems, and with openable windows. The hypothesis that I would like to suggest is our regulations are driving the industry to reduce the amount of energy that is consumed, and this results in solar control glazing or smaller windows. Daylighting is often treated as a secondary benefit. And I believe our regulations lead us to design our buildings to protect us from the external environment, keep warm in the winter, protect us from the sun, and keep the wind and the rain out. But our building regulations do not address daylight. Daylight is somewhat an afterthought. Credits can be awarded in LEED and BREEM to achieve adequate daylight. And more recently, the WOW version 2, issued in May this year, makes reference to the importance of daylight by restricting the minimal visual light transmission of the glass to 40% and defining the percentage area of windows to floor area. And meeting this guidance will help our buildings achieve adequate daylight. And yet the question I would pose is how can our buildings have the best daylit spaces? I would like to share with you a quote from Louis Kahn. I sense light as the giver of all presences, a material spent light. What is made by light casts a shadow, and that shadow belongs to light. We asked this question in the invitation to the breakfast talk. Why do we not have more adaptable facade systems in London? Developers and architects might speak of any of the following. They're just too expensive. The upfront cost is too high. Will they actually perform as they're meant to do? Will they do what they were asked to be? There is a fear that the system will break. They cost too much to maintain. The facade depth is too large and we would like to maximise the size of the internal space and lettable area. And it also ruins the aesthetic. We do not want to be known as the building with the blinds. And it would also be argued that an adequate internal environment can be achieved with the passive approach by adjusting the form of the building and clever positioning and sizing of the windows, adequate conditions and, and daylight can be created. It would be argued that simple is always the best. These are all good reasons. Yet, we should ask the question, what are we missing out by not having an adaptable facade? Well, I say we're missing out on the benefits that nature has to offer us and has given us freely. When the conditions are right, our facade should allow the daylight into the space and not be compromised by the solar control glass that was designed for a more harsh environment. And when conditions are right, we should be able to open our windows to benefit from the free cooling and the connection with the outdoor environment. A quote from Le Cabusier. Space and light and order, those are the things that men need just as much as they need bread or a place to sleep. We are inherently outdoor creatures. We have lived most of our evolution outdoors and have only recently spent the last few thousand years indoors. Consequently, even with the advancements of LED lighting, the best form of light for us is still daylight. We may be in an environment that has the perfect artificial light and the perfect temperature, 
but as most of us will know, in time we will become uncomfortable with the space. We actually enjoy the variability that daylight offers. The variability of daylight produces endorphins, the pleasure drug, and I'm sure we can all appreciate the dappled light that we get from a walk through the forest. Daylight is important for our circadian rhythms. This is your internal body clock which controls your sleep-wake cycle. Having the right exposure to daylight during the day affects our circadian rhythms and helps us to sleep at night. A lack of daylight can have the opposite effect and we can also appreciate how a poor night's sleep can affect our productivity the next day. And again, yet daylight is not a priority when it comes to our building design in the UK. Views and wow factor are the drivers for our fully glazed boxes that we create in London, yet sadly not daylight. I would like to share some research with you on the impact that daylight can have on our productivity. A study conducted in a secondary store in Denmark showed that the grades for students sitting next to the window were 5 to 14% higher and showed 20 to 26 faster learning. Some good stats. There may be a rush to get your child to sit next to the window at your next meeting with a tutor. Research by Cornell University in New York reinforces the connection of natural light with employee well-being. The research study found that the optimization of natural light in an office significantly improves health and wellness among workers. In fact, this research revealed that workers in daily office environments reported a 51% drop in incidence of eye strain, a 63% drop in the incidence of headaches, and a 56 reduction in drowsiness. And an opinion survey of almost 2,000 American employees concluded that access to natural light and views of the outdoors were the number one attribute of the workplace environment, outranking other perks like on-site cafeterias, fitness centres and premium perks including on-site childcare. The Future Workplace Employee Experience study found 78% of employees say access to natural light and views improved their well-being and 70% reported improved work performance. But natural light isn't the only important aspect of workplace wellness, of course. For example, one frequently cited study showed that improved air quality caused mental cognition to soar. Where the external environment allows for it, natural ventilation offers a real benefit as a free source of cooling, the ability to control the internal environment on your own and get direct feedback from your actions like for instance opening a window, <coughs> enables a threshold temperature at which you feel comfortable to increase. Also, a naturally ventilated system that uses windows as the source of ventilation, it is worth being mindful that the contrasting colour between the open window and the light through the adjacent glass, if it is heavily solar controlled coated, can lead to fatigue, thus reinforcing the benefit of using glazing with minimal solar control coating in combination with open windows. Our weather changes by the hour, the day and by the season, and yet our facades are static, designed to the worst case external conditions. Our regulations are not forcing our industry to build buildings with better spaces. Land is expensive and understandably to make a project commercially attractive requires the design team to maximise the lettable area of the building. This can result in a building with a deep floor when maintaining adequate daylighting and meeting the credits in BREM become unachievable. Our regulations are focused on safety, quite rightly, and the need to reduce the amount of energy that our buildings consume. And recently, most of you will have heard the need to limit the maximum temperature of global warming from 2 degrees centigrade to 1.5 degrees C. The solar gain passing through the glazing hits up the office space. This increase in temperature is then removed by the cooling systems to maintain a comfortable environment. The more solar gain, the bigger cooling plant required and the more energy that is used. As our regulations become more onerous over time, the amount of energy that our buildings can consume will reduce. It is likely then the allowable solar heat entering the facade will require to be reduced further, resulting in smaller windows and the need to have higher solar controlled glass. And this will reduce the potential benefit of daylight further. But it's worth asking ourselves, how do other countries design for daylight? It is interesting to note in Germany, which is normally associated with high productivity of the manufacturing sector, they place a larger emphasis on daylight in offices. Their workplace regulations require that the floor depth is limited to 2.5 times the ceiling height. 
If the building is open plan and there are windows on both elevations, then the overall floor depth is limited to five times the floor to ceiling height. Floor depths can be made larger, but the darker space in the middle can only be used for amenity spaces, such as stairs, toilets and kitchens. The system to control the solar heat gain is also required, resulting in a greater uptake of dynamic facade systems. Going back to what Farah said and my experience at university of finding clients and clearly understanding what they wanted. If you ask the known or occupier what they would want from their building, good daylighting and the ability to open windows for natural ventilation would appear high in their list of requirements. I was lucky enough recently to attend a presentation from Stefan Beelings of Fosters and Partners. And there were a couple of observations that I took from his point of view that I would like to share with you. The first is that he compared our industry with the food industry. A few years ago, we did not know that certain foods were bad for our house. And then through lobbying, values for salts and sugars and preservatives were put onto our packets. This helped kickstart the market for organic and healthier foods, which started as a niche product and are now a mainstream. It's taken a while for the customer to become knowledgeable and to start making informed and healthy choices. And I believe it is the same with our building industry. It is a lot easier and more economic to create buildings with a deep floor plan and relatively simple facades. But are they compromising our health? And are they not providing the most productive environments to work in? If you compare with all the costs of running a service business over a 10 year period, these are the visible costs that our industry are interested in and strive to reduce. Yet the labor cost of that service business is significantly more than the construction and maintenance cost of the building. And by increasing the productivity of our staff by just a small amount through better daylighting, will offset the increasing cost of the facade system. Our offices should be designed as our most productive environments. It should provide us with the conditions that we can work to our best and definitely worth the commute. Otherwise, one would argue, why don't we work from home? As our prospective tenants become more informed and realise the benefit of daylight and the buildings can be differentiated in terms of productivity, then more buildings with dynamic facades will prevail. So what is my vision for the future? It is clear that our buildings will need to become more energy efficient and regulations become tighter. And we are seeing this already with clients asking us to design the buildings to weather files based on predicted data of the future and to improve on the energy performance of current regulations. Our cities will definitely become busier, albeit as electrical vehicles become more prevalent, they will become quieter and less polluted. Well, I hope and I expect so. And then having a building where you have relatively dark glass or cannot open the window and benefit from the free, fresh air would seem so terribly antiquated. Yet there's another way that we can benefit from the external environment has to offer us. I would like to share with you or introduce to you a project that we worked with the Renzo Piano Building Workshop. The buildings are in Hanzhou in China. Now China is not known for its clean air, so a building which can be naturally ventilated would seem unusual. However, the Chinese see value of opening windows and appreciate the connectivity with the outdoor space to fill the air, to hear the sounds. The facade consists of opening windows at high level and externally mounted blinds to control solar heat gain whilst allowing a view through. But what I like about this project is that on each floor there's a row of planters allowing vines to grow up the facade, providing natural shading. The dapple light that we instinctively enjoy as well as collecting particles in the air and improving the air quality of the natural ventilation. The leaves contain moisture that evaporates and this evaporation cools the air entering the building. The vines also provide a view out to nature which has been shown to be a factor in improving well-being. I mentioned to a fellow commuter that I was doing this talk on the importance of a view out and how a view of nature can improve your well-being. I talked to her about the research study on a call centre by the Californian Energy Commission that showed that workers were able to process calls 6 to 12 per cent faster when they had the best possible view compared to no view and performed 10 to 25 per cent better on tests of mental function and memory recall. Working at a large multinational bank that looks onto another glassy building, she was a bit disappointed by the scene that she currently looks out onto. Yet, imagine 
if the benefit of the view of nature was understood better, and that as an industry we had a responsibility of providing a view of nature, not only for our own building occupants, yet altruistically also for the occupants of surrounding buildings that look onto us. And then I have an exciting view of the future of our cities, where the adaptive facade can work in unison with our green cities. And that certainly would be worth a commute. However, the cost of adaptive facade is going to be more expensive than a standard sealed box, both in terms of initial upfront and maintenance costs. If our industry does come to understand the important benefits of daylight, and that our facades should adapt to maximise this benefit, yet we are still concerned with the costs and the reliability fear, what alternative business model could address this and help stimulate the active facade market? And again, I would like to take inspiration from another industry. Let's take the car industry. New and higher quality cars are more prevalent on our roads, and this is in part due to personal leasing. The change of attitude away from ownership to renting. If the dynamic facade was leased to the building owner, then the responsibility for its performance would fall to the leasing company. Perhaps with a significant penalty should the product fail. And this could potentially work out less expensive than the current model, which requires, in case of a blind system, to be purchased by the facade contractor, and then on to the main contractor, and then on to the developer, and then eventually to the user, with each making a profit. The same happens with the maintenance contracts to maintain the warranties. The quality of the components would improve, and the manufacturer responsible for the on-site performance. They would get the invaluable feedback from site for the future development of the products. And it would be in their interest for the manufacturer to make robust, reliable products, and thus minimising replacement costs which would they would have to absorb. And at the end of the product's life, the manufacturer would be responsible for upgrading it and recycling it, and this would help to support a circular economy. Now, I believe the notion of the office building that is solely valued on the size of the lateral area is an outdated concept. I believe that we have a responsibility to design our offices to be the most productive, creative, healthy environments and a joy to work in. Today's employees recognise that workplace environment is now part of the overall employee experience and central to attracting, employing and retaining top talent. And I believe that excellent daylight spaces and access to nature, a good view and ability to control your own environment is a major influencer to achieving this. And a dynamic facade which allows people to connect with the environment and maximise its benefits is one tool to help us, the industry, to achieve this goal. I would like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. A quote from Louis Kahn. This has been updated by, uh, by Farah to the modern world. The sun never knew how great she was until she hit the side of a building. And I don't think this presentation would be complete without showing you a truly inspirational dynamic concept. And that wouldn't be amazing if all our buildings could do this. The exposed mechanism is a thing of beauty and I would love to know how it could work. It takes me back to the time I was a small boy and the carriage clock was on the mantelpiece. <laughs> if I only could find my grandfather's toolbox. <laughs> Thank you. I believe it's question time. Um, one of the things that always helps convince clients that this is a good way to go is actual hard facts. Yeah. So do you have any examples of projects you've worked on with any post-completion data, post occupancy work that demonstrate gains? Yeah, um, there's the BRE. I was involved in a project um, which was creating a specification for the energy office of the future. 
and it was at the time when the only, uh, the only guidance was the SIBSI guidance for measuring what comfort was. And uh, we helped develop a new specification called the, uh, the Office of the Future, uh, which, which enabled natural ventilation and daylighting to be enhanced, but it did mean that the temperature which you felt comfortable with would have to change. It would have to be a wider spectrum. And, um, and the first building that was created with this uh, specification was, uh, it was called BRE Building 16, or the Energy Office of the Future in, in, in Watford. And there they had uh, glass louvers on the outside to prevent the heat gain coming in. Um, and they had uh, solar chimneys. Um, so we were learning techniques from, you know, things that we'd forgot from the Victorian area. Um, you know, the Victorians used to keep their fires on during the, during the summer and have their windows open to allow the airflow to come in to, to, to get up, to up there. So they, they did a, a sort of a two-year occupant study in terms of how that building was, was, was working. Um, and it has performed very well. I think the top floor, which didn't have the glass even something, was a little bit hot, but the other two floors were working really well. Um, perhaps we can give you the, the information afterwards. How does um, the dynamics does that translate to residential buildings? Because what are office buildings and, and the different use? Yeah, I, I guess with the, the you saw the, the buildings, the, the one in France there, yeah. where we had the, uh, the external shutters. And my colleagues, the, you know, we have many colleagues from Italy and France and Spain, and, and they, they, they're surprised why we don't have shutters on, their building, on our buildings. And I, and I guess in the past, our summers haven't been hot enough to, to require that, and maybe we don't see the benefit of the nighttime ventilation and I believe through our weather files in the future, our, our summers will get longer and hotter. So maybe more shutters will, will come. And the, you know, there's, there's some beautiful um, domestic products uh, that have been developed on the continent for, for that particular reason. Um, and, and I guess on domestic, you have smaller windows, so the, you know, the heat gain's going to be less. But yeah, let's have more shutters on, on our, res our domestic buildings. So if, um, if for the limitation that is, <coughs> is cost, do you think um, if all users, end users were aware of those benefits, they'd be happy to pick up you know, some of those costs in, in rental leasing? Going back to the, the overall cost of running that, that, that building and, and, and that the, the staff cost was significantly more than all the other costs involved with, with, with running that business. So if you can show, you know, the productivity of your staff is improving. And, and, and I think intrinsically we, we know that. You know, everyone wants to sit next to a window. Everyone wants to have good daylight and everyone wants to open a window. Uh, we can do as much research as we can, but everyone feels that's the right thing. So um, if you can do that and the environment allows you to do that and you feel that actually you're going to be more productive and by being more productive you're actually saving the company a lot of money, um, then why don't we do it? What we can do to not add additional energy to adaptive systems? Can we develop systems which are working by themselves or...? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research uh, at the moment for um, uh, systems that just automatically adjust. Um, I, I, did a, I did a project about 10 years ago which was using a thermohydraulic drive and uh, you, you had uh, two tubes which um, contained a gas or a liquid that turned into a, to a gas at a certain temperature. And depending on which tube saw the most of the sun, it would cause a pressure and then that would force a cylinder or a piston to move the, to move the louvers. And then, so it would automatically track so it would have no motors and, and so forth. And I think there's further technologies in terms of bimetallic strips or, or, or very thin glass that can be connected on the outside the building and automatically turn to, uh, to provide the, the natural daylight. But I, f I also feel that you know, the users need to have that control. If the users don't have the control, then part of the benefit is lost. So is it about natural light that you can't reproduce with artificial light? Well, I, I, as I understand it, that and again, this is talking to my daylighting expert, <laughs> is that natural light has a variability to it. It's never constant. You know, it changes in colour, it changes in intensity, um, and we enjoy that variability that it offers. 
So, you know, whether it's possible to do it with LEDs. I went, I went to um, another conference where they were talking about you know, fluorescent lighting in the 60s. You know, we, start, we started off having very shallow plan buildings. But then the fluorescent lighting was invented and then we started having massive deep plan offices because, because we could get the same sort of lighting. Um, and, and we're, we're having a situation where you know, more people than ever wear glasses than they used to. And so there was a correlation between the, 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 the quality of the artificial light and, and problem with short-sightedness. So maybe we're going through the same thing with LEDs. Maybe we just don't know the potential problem that they're offering. You know, we've evolved for years to, to work with daylight. Well, I found it imme immediately chimed with my own experience um, of uh, daylight, that it's the one thing that I really love and want when I'm in a workspace. So when I heard about the statistics that could be correlated to uh, work and production, I found that instantly interesting and very supportive of the argument about how important daylight is for the workspace. So it was very informative to get some numbers, some empirical numbers, that went with the, the kind of general conversation and the sense of uh, how, how important daylight is to our working space. Well, I'm a cyclist, so I know that there's been lots of changes in the way in which cycle provision has been uh, incorporated into town planning, urban design, and into the design of buildings, and particularly commercial buildings, how there are facilities for cyclists uh, in terms of um, spaces in basements and other kind of facilities for them. And I think that'll just spread through into the working space because one of the great frustrations if you've ever worked in these big open plan offices is that it's impossible to control your own environment. So that is a really interesting conundrum, how you control that facade, how you adapt it and can open a window, uh, and how the systems that control the rest of the building can, can adapt to that kind of user interface. So when you open a window, the air conditioning might turn off and vice versa when you shut the window then, then can kick back on and that's a really interesting uh, new phase for development with uh, buildings. I think uh, I enjoyed the talk a lot I think it was really really good um, I think for me the tipping point will probably come through legislation you know if um, you know if pick up on Rob's points about health and safety um, and energy reduction those two items have only really come on in leaps and bounds through big changes in legislation so I feel that perhaps a, an onus on natural light and daylight uh, will only come from a legislative change you know things like Briam and well are all kind of nice to haves really you know you don't have to have them and the, you know planners kind of take a different view sometimes but uh, BCO is a guide you know it's not set so I think it's a legislation change that will really drive kind of daylight levels perhaps moving towards something like what we have in Europe and the German standards he referred to um, that probably will then be the spur to drive more innovation more kind of creative approaches to how we achieve high levels of daylight at the same time as meeting all the other requirements of the building. First of all like any project starting to understand what a client wants out of the building and you know, that can work from the single sole practitioner working with Mrs. Miggings on her house extension all the way up to a big mature developer and kind of really teasing out at the beginning exactly what their goals are. And if you understand those clearly at the beginning, then actually the architecture tends to kind of follow a path that ends up not changing very much. You know, if you start the design by coming up with something that doesn't meet a lot of their criteria but is you know, the next greatest icon or something, actually what you find is the design tends to get watered down quite a lot through sort of a thousand little processes. But understanding the brief at the beginning and kind of really then using that and kind of crafting that brief with a client is the thing that I find quite the most interesting bit of a project really and I like the technical side, I like the design side I even like, and I like seeing things getting constructed and finished. Um, I think the thing that's probably most interesting in our industry at the moment is um, looking at post-occupancy work and looking at this idea of aftercare and you know we, we traditionally in our industry have kind of finished buildings and kind of walked away and hopefully work with another cl the client again but never really gone back and questioned the idea of whether the buildings operating from an architectural perspective and right now we're fortunate enough to have a couple of end user occupiers and we're starting to tease some of that data out of them and that's actually quite interesting because we can use that to really show other 
potentially new clients, actually these things work and these are the, the, this is the data that supports it, the hard facts.